No. Yeah. 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 So now I'm going to um, give a really brief presentation of my dissertation research. And my study was entitled Adapting a Brief Evidence-Based Intervention for Text Message Delivery to Young Adult Black Women. So before I begin, I would like to thank a couple of um, organizations. The UCLA Center for HIV Identification, Prevention, and Treatment Services awarded me a pilot grant of $15,000 that came from the National <coughs> Institutes of Mental Health and the Sigma Theta Tau International Honor Society of Nursing, Gamma Tau at Large Chapter, um, awarded me a $2,000 pilot study grant. So I had $17,000 with which to study this study. That was very helpful. So when thinking about sexual health disparities among U.S. women, African American women, or I tend to use the term black women, have had the highest rates of chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, and HIV for many, many years. Only in the last year of this publication have black women not had the highest rates of syphilis. It's now among American Indian, Indian Alaska Natives. But um, among 20 to 24 year old black women, we still have the highest rates of syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and HIV. And the question is really, why is this happening? So there are a number of unsubstantiated assumptions about why black women have high rates of sexually transmitted diseases. And one of them is that black women have more sexual partners than their peers, which is actually not true. In every case, this, this isn't the truth. Um, researchers have found this to be false. There's also a, an assumption that says black women use condoms less frequently than other women, which again is not always the case. Researchers have found evidence against this. So why are black women having higher numbers of STDs than other women? One of the factors causing this disparity is their location of primary residence. Um, lack of health care access and utilization, and then their socioeconomic status. Also, black women have really high rates of um, int intra-racial dating. So they tend to date, the heterosexual black women tend to date heterosexual black men. And the high rates of homicide and incarceration among black men lead to um, higher rates of STDs among black women because black men tend to have more concurrent relationships than their peers. So in a group of men, a black man is more likely to have a relationship with more than one woman at a time than other men are. And this um, puts those women, or really everybody involved in the relationship, at risk for STDs. Another thing is incomplete reporting. So it's been found by several researchers that incomplete or underreporting occurs um, at a lot of the clinics or healthcare facilities that black people utilize. So especially among um, clinicians who use Title X government funding, they tend to screen for STDs more often than clinicians who are using private insurance or have some other mode of insurance. Um, and so it's not necessarily that black women have higher STD rates, but the reports are higher among black women. The last thing is data collection bias, and again, this has to do with the incomplete and um, underreporting. They're not reporting the same things for everybody. So while these numbers look like this, this might not actually be the reality. So when looking at what we could do to intervene among young women ages 18 to 24, I looked for sexual um, behavior interventions, and I found a publication called The Compendium of HIV. Um, behavioral intervention. And this compendium is, is wonderful. It has 93 different interventions that are specific for high-risk sexual behaviors. All of these interventions, their purpose is to decrease um, high-risk sexual behavior and increase condom use among the participants. 56 of these interventions are what are called best evidence interventions. So they have a certain criteria. This is their prospective study designs. They compare results of intervention and control groups. They're minimally biased in their sampling procedure. They have retention rates of 70% or more at the end of the in intervention, and they have a follow-up assessment period of three months or more after intervention completion. So again, 56 out of 93 are best evidence, and unfortunately, only five of these interventions were created solely for black women. So even though black women have the highest rates of STDs, only five out of the 93 interventions were created specifically for them. These are the five. And so you can look and see that they all have different 
session frequencies, they have different numbers of sessions, session length, and number of participants. I like the sister to sister um, intervention best because number one, it's a single session intervention. So we already have issues getting these young women to come into the clinic in the first place. You really don't want to use the intervention where you're having them come in two and three times, you know, over a two month period of time. The likelihood of them coming back isn't always that great. Um, also, this intervention, when it's done for a single woman, is only 20 minutes long, which is a wonderful thing because in the clinic, our appointments are 20 minutes. And you can barely get people to stay for that amount of time, a lot of time. You don't really want them to be involved in an intervention where they're sitting there for two or three hours at a time. Um, and then the last thing is that this intervention can be used with individuals or groups. So whereas uh, three of the other, or two of the other interventions, actually three of them are group intervention, um, you have to wait until you have enough participants to run this intervention. With a single session or individual intervention, you can do it as soon as that one person is ready. So I then looked at text messaging interventions because again, we know that these women aren't coming into the clinic in growth, so how do we get to them before they need to come to us? And looking at the text message interventions, there were five interventions for high-risk sexual behavior. Again, none of these interventions were specifically created for black women, which was kind of an issue. Um, but I went to them because text messaging is very popular. Um, one particular researcher said that this style is needed for young adults because they're used to it. The CDC in particular encourages mHealth um, interventions to reach this target population, 98% of young adults in the U.S. own a cell phone. So that's pretty much everybody. And of that number, 97% of 18 to 29 year olds utilize text messaging. So if you want to get to them, you go to where they're at. They're texting. Texting also removes barriers to health care, so you don't have to worry about getting in your car and driving anywhere. You can receive text messages, text messages wherever you happen to be. And it's the most simple method of in-health. So you can also do things on the internet, you can use apps, but text messaging is the most simplified version of those things. Um, again, when looking at these different text message interventions, different message delivery types, there were two-way messages, meaning they can receive a message from you, but they can also send a message to you. SMS, meaning text-only messages. Um, only one of the interventions, the safe sex, um, among Australian men and women use MMS or multimedia text messages. So that's pictures and um, memes, things like that, and videos. Um, they were sent at different frequencies and were completed over different durations. And so when I looked at this, I thought about, well, these um, text messages or text messaging interventions are great, but there needs to be some kind of adaptation done. So I went back to the literature and saw that effective HIV prevention interventions all have sound behavioral or social science theoretical frameworks. And then I started to put together a conceptual model. The first thing I did was look at how I wanted to approach this study. So I looked through four different philosophical lenses. First was empiricism, and this is um, a philosophy that says experience is the source of all knowledge. It says that we want to substantiate theoretical claims and maintain objectivity. So this was the quantitative piece of my study. Then I looked at critical theory, which is a theory that empowers marginalized populations and liberates social change. So for me, the high rates of STD disparities among black women is a social issue. It's a justice issue. It's more than just a health issue. So I wanted to attack it from that standpoint. Also utilize pragmatism, which um, looks at practical and applicable and useful research. So I didn't want to do a research study that was only good for the study's purpose. I wanted it to be good out in the public once you know the study was over. And pragmatism also says that the researcher is a research participant. So it wasn't just me looking at the, the participants in my study. I actually participated in this study, and you'll see how in a minute. Um, and this was the qualitative piece of my study. And lastly, there was the intersectionality lens um, that takes into consideration the compounded effects of demographics. So when we look at young adult black women, we're looking at their age, their gender, 
and their ethnicity, but these things all intertwine. We can't look at them separately. We have to look at the compounded effects of all three. Um, and so I looked at intersectionality. It also says that marginalized people are ignored when demographics are viewed separately. So I didn't want to look at them separately. I wanted to bring it all together. So in doing that, um, in the literature, there were a couple of theories that sort of popped out every time I saw a higher sexual behavior intervention. And they were the social cognitive theory, theory of planned behavior, and then sometimes the theory of gender and power. So social cognitive theory says that learning occurs through symbolism, forethought, vicarious learning, self-regulation, and self-reflection. And it has several constructs to this theory, but the one that I found most important was self-efficacy here. The theory of planned behavior says that beliefs influence attitudes, um, subjective norms, and perceived behavioral control, and this leads to an intention to perform a certain behavior. Um, and so again, I thought that intentions was the most um, important construct of this particular theory. And then lastly, the theory of gender and power is a theory of gender relations. And the most important construct in that is power. So when looking at my conceptual model, um, I saw it as knowledge leads to beliefs about a certain behavior, which then influences your attitude or your self-efficacy, which is your, your belief in yourself to carry out a certain action. Those two things combine and influence your intentions, whether you intend to or not to do a certain behavior. This is um, moderated or modified by power, especially in sexual relationships, because there are two people involved. You're not making the decision for yourself. There's somebody else involved that you have to kind of get on the same page with. And this all leads to condoms at the end, whether you do or you don't. So in phase one of my study, the aim was to adapt the sisters. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Question. Um, can you talk a little bit? You've mentioned this a couple of times. Your concern about the interventions not being specific for Black women. Can you talk a little bit about why why you think that's so important and what kind of um, uh, 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 in intervention components may not be? We're not in the in the one you designed versus the, the literature that reflected non not specific for black women? So um, the literature specifically says that intervention, behavioral intervention, should be culturally and gender specific. You want to make your intervention as specific as possible to target the population that the intervention was created for. And while sometimes interventions that are created for both men and women work, the ones that tend to be most effective are those that are for a singular gender and for a specific ethnic group. Um, the five interventions that I talked about previously were all created solely for black women. And that was really important to me because um, they, they included things like uh, black female facilitators so that the participants could see someone who looks like them who was giving them this information. Um, they included things in their, in the context of the curriculum that spoke specifically to black women. And I just think this is important because um, it, it takes away generalizations and it takes away people's ability to say, well, that's nice, but it's not really about me. No, they're talking specifically about you. And so all of those five uh, interventions included gender and ethnic specific um, cur curricula. And so I didn't do anything differently than those five had already done, because they were gender specific and ethnic. And you notice the difference between the ones not focused on black women versus those that were, in um, terms of what, what was not included in the particularly black focus. Not in like skill building or anything, but more so in the ability of the interventions to be, to have qualities that made the young women feel prideful of their culture. And that was really important. So um, good sexual health was no longer about you. It was about doing something for the black community. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, can you go back to the slide and your model? Yeah. Um, Let's take the same approach um, in terms of the picking of the intervention and it having been culturally driven um, in terms of your thinking of would be the most impactful. One of the things we often do is then also try and look at uh, models. In terms of the order that you have the model, can you talk about what 
from the perspective of it fitting for black women that, um, I mean, models have gone lots of different ways. So what about being black and female and HIV prevention does, uh, is reflected in the model? I think the most important thing in this model is the power piece. Um, because there have been some uh, researchers, of which you're one, um, who have uh, published uh, studies that say things like, you know, black women have very different reasons for condom non-use than other women do. Um, some of these reasons include things like back in the 70s when there was a thought that um, there was some sort of population control or, you know, are they trying to control my ability to have black children? Um, also, uh, there have been several articles, especially among the younger um, generation, that say, I don't want to use condoms specifically among black young women because I don't want my partner to think I'm cheating on him. Or if I use a condom, he'll think that I think he's cheating on me. So this, this power struggle and this power issue of making sure that black men still feel, um, I don't want to say superior, but feel like they sort of have the upper hand in black relationships is really important among young black women. <laughs> Okay, so um, in phase one, this was a two-phase uh, study that included mixed methods, and the purpose was to adapt the text message version of the sister-sister intervention for use among young adult black women. The aim of um, phase one was to adapt the current sister-sister curriculum into 160-character text messages. And so I looked at the literature and selected the adapted model um, by Linda and Di Clemente for the purposes of increasing the rigor of the study. Um, and I actually had to modify it. So the original adapted model is like the little arrow you see in the middle. It's more of a linear model. Um, you can go back, but things need to be done in sequence. I found that I had to add study. So we started off with assessment and decision. This was done prior to ever doing anything for this study, but in my literature review and in the creation of my um, dissertation proposal, that's where I assessed the situation and made the decision that I was going to use the sister-to-sister -sister intervention. Then we went to adaptation, where I used a community-based participatory research approach and recruited um, members of a research advisory board. So there were seven members of this board. We met four times over two to three hours and um, kind of worked out the adapted um, text message intervention. The first meeting that we had included what's called theater testing. So I had a nurse practitioner come in and run the original intervention in front of the group so they could see what it looks like. And then for the other three meetings, we talked about how do we take this intervention and make it into text messaging format. Um, we had production which included creation of um, memes, pictures, and video that would be included in the intervention. I took everything that we came up with to my topical experts, the four women sitting here, my dissertation committee, and we integrated what the research advisory board said with what the topical experts said to create a revised um, intervention. At that point, we went back, I um, recruited a different focus group. So different women from who were on my research advisory board, and there were uh, five young women. And they met one time for between two and three hours, and we discussed the intervention that we had come up with in the research advisory board. There was theater testing again, so I brought back the same nurse practitioner to run this intervention so they could see what the original intervention looked like, and then see what our text messaging intervention looked like. They gave me feedback. I went back to production and actually added an extra video based on what they said, and then went back to my topical experts again. We took this information and integrated it into another revised version of the text messaging program. Then I took the um, program to a community advisory board. So when I first started, I talked about the CHIPS organization, which gave me um, a $15,000 grant. They have an advisory board of researchers and community leaders in HIV and STD. Um, there were 20 of them that came to this meeting, and they gave me their feedback. So this was like a third iteration of this text messaging program. After that, I took their feedback back to my um, topical experts again. We integrated it all, 
and then we went into training mode. So during the training, we did kind of a test run of the intervention to make sure that it actually worked, to make sure the text messages went to the right person, they went at the right time, everybody could receive everything. There were eight people who um, were involved in the test run, including myself, my dissertation chair, my two research assistants, and four members of my research advisory board. The <coughs> testing went great, and then, um, or actually the training went great, and then we moved on to phase two, which I'll talk about in a second. So in phase one, there were a total of 12 people involved in the research advisory board and the focus group. However, only 11 of them actually filled out the demographic survey, so that's what's presented here. Most of this group were 20 to 24 years old. They had a high school degree or equivalent. They worked part-time. They had never been um, pregnant and never diagnosed with an STD. The inclusion criteria for the first phase of my study was self-identified black ethnicity, female gender, age 18 to 24, they had to have sexual intercourse in the past three months, and on a mobile phone with text messaging capabilities. Young women were excluded if they were married, if they planned to become pregnant within the next year, or if they shared their mobile phone with another person. So in all of the meetings that I had with the research advisory board and the focus group, there are some really pertinent comments that came out. And all of these names are pseudonyms, these are not the names of the actual people. But for instance, Brooklyn said, I wouldn't, wa I wouldn't watch a long video because it's like, ooh, I only got two gigs this month. So she was really concerned about dating you and not watching very long videos. Charlotte said, honestly, use as many memes as possible. And Delilah concurred, yeah, memes are attention grabbers. Emma, I'm not going to read this whole quote, but she was basically getting at the timing of day that we want to send messages out. So we decided to send affirmation messages or messages with an uplifting tone in the morning at 8 a.m., and then we would send messages that have to do with STD prevention at night at 7 p.m. Um, and then Ava said, but I think nothing more than like two or three times a week, otherwise it just gets too much. So we decided we would only send messages three times a week. When I met with the focus group participants, they their comments reflected just about everything that the research that my board participants said. So, um, for instance, Lillian said, I like that they were very, like, they were short and sweet, like, to the point. So it's like, even with the memes or text messages, you know, you read it, and it's like, okay, it's a constant reminder, so that's why I like it. Kaylee said, I would see myself sending this on to my friends, like, hey, read this really quick or watch this, because they're short videos. It's not like five minutes, so you can watch it pretty quickly. So um, I'll show you on the next slide what they were talking about. Um, once we got to the final version of the text messaging program, we had several areas of content. There were nine in total, and some of the content areas fit, more, more than one content area would sometimes fit on uh, one message. So for instance, you could have a message that contained an affirmation and persuasion, or something like that. Um, there were four different message types. So there was text only, which is the SMS message. There were memes, videos, and pictures, which constituted MMS messages. Um, and I have examples of these on the next slide. And then the message timing, we decided to send out messages every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday over eight weeks, and they were sent again at either eight or seven, depending on the, the message content. So at the top is an example of a text-only message. Hey girl, we want to help you live a long, healthy life and make safe, responsible choices to respect yourself, protect yourself, because you're worth it. The image on the left side is what we considered a meme. So it has a picture in the middle, and all memes were myth fact content. So at the top, it says myth. My partner would think I'm unfaithful if I ask him to use a condom. Fact. It's not a matter of being unfaithful. It's a matter of protecting one another. On the right side is an image of what we consider to be pictures. So there was a picture in the background, and in the foreground, there was information that was um, too much content to put in a text-only message because they can only be 160 characters. But the, the content couldn't be broken up. It was important that it come in one text message, so we put it on a picture. This particular picture is about the swap method or how to persuade your partner to use a condom. And then at the bottom is what we use for videos. Unfortunately, the um, video messaging platform that I use couldn't send videos directly to a phone, so we had to include a link that people could click, and then they could go out to a website and watch the video there. 
So in phase two is where we actually tested the intervention for acceptability and phases and feasibility. Did anybody have any questions? Okay. Um, so there was an aim to determine the acceptability and feasibility of the intervention, and then there was another aim to compare the primary outcome and secondary outcome, which I'll talk about in a second, with the intervention and control group. <coughs> the primary purpose of this um, study was to look at acceptability and feasibility, but I wanted to get preliminary data um, about outcomes so that when I move on to the next phase of the study, I would have something. So at this point, all we were doing was testing. As far as recruitment and retention, um, I screened 142 young women. Of those 142, 100 were eligible. So the women who were ineligible it was because they were either too old, um, they had not had heterosexual intercourse in the past three months, they were in ethnicity other than black, um, and then one person was actually in the focus group, so she couldn't be in the next phase of study as well. So of those who were eligible, 96 people returned the consent forms to me. Of that number, um, I then sent out baseline uh, surveys and 92 returned their baseline survey. So once their baseline surveys were back to me, I randomized them to either the intervention group or the control group. There were 45 people placed in the intervention group and 47 in the control group. 45, or I'm sorry, 42 of the 45 people in the intervention group opted into the text messages. This means when I randomized them, I sent them an email that says your keyword is blank and you send it to this particular number. Um, and that's how you enroll in the study. So 42 people chose to do that. Uh, in the control group, 46 of them chose to opt in. Um, and then the intervention started. They got the text messages for eight weeks, and at the end, they all got a follow-up survey. Everybody in the intervention group who opted in completed the follow-up survey. So they had a 100% retention rate. Only 45 of the 46 people in the control group filled out the follow-up survey, and so they had a 97.8% retention rate. So overall, for this phase of the study, retention was 98.9%, which is amazingly high um, for an intervention study. So in phase two, the demographics were very similar to those in phase one. Most of the participants were ages 20 to 24. Most of them in this particular phase had some college but no bachelor's degree. Uh, most of them worked part-time. Um, most of them had not been pregnant. However, there was a difference between the control group and the intervention group in that the intervention group had more young women who had previously been pregnant than the control group. And then um, current pregnancies, I found through just talking to young women that some of them were actually pregnant during the study. So at the end, we went back and asked how many of you were pregnant during the study. Four young women said yes, and interestingly, they all have to be in the intervention group. So that made another difference between the control and intervention group. And the majority of participants had not had an STD. There were five different mobile service providers that were used, um, and there was no real group difference among these. And then looking at the area code for the phone number that they used for the text messages, the majority of them came from the south, which is consistent with um, data that shows most black people in the United States still live in the South. So for phase two, there were two different types of data collection measures. Um, I collected objective data where I could look to see what was going on. I also collected subjective data where the participants had to tell me their responses. So for the objective data, I was able to use the messaging and the video streaming platforms to look at message delivery and link clicks, and then video loads, plays, and finishes, which I'll talk about in a second. For the subjective data, all of this came from um, SurveyMonkey, and there were a few different types of surveys that I gave out. The first was an acceptability feasibility survey that I actually came up with. It had 15 Likert scale items, and they had items like, I enjoy receiving the text messages. There were also two short answer items, um, such as how can the text message program be improved? And then they, you know, wrote in their response. For the CDC sexual behavior questions, um, there were 12 of these questions and they were asked for main partner as well as casual partner. So it was kind of like 24 questions really. 
um, the questions were yes, no. So the, they would ask questions like, in the past three months, have you had vaginal sex where your partner's penis entered your vagina? They would either say yes or no. I ended up taking this information and transforming it so that I could tell whether or not they use condoms sometimes, always, or never based on their yes or no responses. Um, then for the self, the common use self-efficacy um, scale, there are actually, there are several scales in this, or sub-scales in this scale. I use two of them. So I use the mechanic subscale, which asks questions like, um, I feel confident in my ability to put a condom on my partner. There were four items like that. And then the assertiveness subscale asks questions like, I feel confident in my ability to discuss condom usage with any partner I may have. There are three items like that. There was the sexual risk scale, the intention subscale, which has seven microscale items, such as safer sex is a habit for me. And the last scale was the sexual relationship power scale, the sexual control subscale, which had 15 items and included items such as if my partner asks, or if I asked my partner to use a condom, he would get violent. So it was looking at power dynamics and relationships. All of the subscales used, um, had adequate psychometric quality, so um, their reliability was really good. As far as message delivery, um, all messages were delivered to 78.6% of participants, and that's 33. Um, 39 people reported that they had no issues with their mobile phones during the um, during the study. But three people reported that they had issues with their mobile phone, such as their phone wasn't in service for a period of time, or their mobile phone has to be replaced, or their number has to be changed during the study. Um, for four people, or 9.5% of the um, study participants, and these are specifically intervention participants, not everybody, not the control group, um, they had issues with their phones and, well, issues with message delivery. So they only received the SMS messages, meaning they only received text-only messages. They didn't receive any of the memes or pictures. And when I went back to look at the data, I noticed that three of them had T-Mobile as their um, carrier, which we won't, we won't say anything about T-Mobile, but they had T-Mobile. And then one had Metro PCS. So, um, I'm thinking that the issues were not with my platform, but more so with their service providers. Um, and then five people, or 11.9% of the intervention group, had messages that bounced. So bouncing is, I send you a message, but for whatever reason, it wasn't received. As far as the videos being watched, I collected self-reported data, and then I looked at the platform reports as well. So the self-reported data told me that 15 participants reported watching all seven videos, and that the mean number of videos watched was 4.38 out of seven, which is a really good number. But when I went and looked at the platform reports, I could see the number of links clicked for each video, the number of times it loaded onto the web page, the number of times the person actually pushed the play button, and the number of times the video was finished, so it played all the way to completion. Um, and there's some issues with this because using this platform, I couldn't tell who was clicking what. I could just tell the number of times that a link was clicked, but not who clicked it. Or I could tell the number of times the play button was pressed, but not who pressed it. Um, but looking at the platform report, it's really inconsistent with the self-reported data because 15 people say they watched all seven videos. But if you look at the number of plays, not even finishes, but just the number of times the play button was clicked for each video, there are only four videos where it could be possible, actually there are only three videos where it could be possible for 15 people to have clicked the button because all the other numbers are less than 15. So there are some questions about how did you watch a video that you never clicked play for, and I have some thoughts about that that I'll talk about towards the end. For the acceptability feasibility survey, um, the survey findings came out really good. The highest um, possible number for the survey um, total of the scale was 75, and for the intervention group, their mean total was 60, which was very similar to the control groups. Um, and this tells me that whether the messages were about sexual health or diet and exercise, which is what the control group got. They liked text messaging. It didn't matter what the content was. They just 
like receiving information via text. Um, you can see at the bottom, I didn't ask the control group about videos because they didn't receive any videos. But the, number, the different items that had the highest scores for the intervention group included, like I found it difficult to receive the text messages. Because this um, question is asked in a negative way, the score is actually reversed. So it's reverse coded when you score it. So a high number is actually good on the negative um, type questions. Um, and they got almost, you know, a perfect score. A perfect score would be five. Another question was, I know women who would benefit from receiving these types of text messages, 4.48 out of five, which is really great. I was unable to view the videos which again is a negative type question, so we reversed the score, and 4.41, really good. The only score that was, um, it wasn't even low, it was more in the neutral category, was I wish there were more text messages. So some people did wish there were more, some people didn't. So, um, and then there were qualitative responses or, um, you know, short answer responses that told me that quite a few people actually liked the number of text messages, they didn't want to go over. A few people said they would like less text messages. Some of these qualitative responses included things like, I enjoyed reading the text messages as they were delivered in a simple format and definitely catered to our generation by using text and memes, etc. Or, I really appreciated the convenience in receiving critical information via everyday technology. I also appreciated the time of day the messages were sent. I typically got messages after I had gotten settled in from a long day. Everybody didn't give positive feedback though. There were a couple of responses like, the text did not fit my needs and were irrelevant and not helpful. Or they were informative but a nuisance. So for these people, texting isn't the way to go, which is okay. I'm not saying that every intervention from here on out needs to be text messaging. But for those who want to receive information in this way, it's a great way to send it. My personal favorite um, response was, every time I received a text, I would stop what I was doing and share it with my friends, and they became excited to hear what was next when the next text came. So sharing this information with friends, while it's not a great thing to do in a study, um, in a public health standpoint, this is absolutely wonderful. There were also suggestions for improvement. So these suggestions were put into various categories, including message frequency. There were several people who thought that the messages should be sent more frequently. Um, there were several people who thought the messages should be sent at varying times of day, or at least they should be able to choose the time of day that they receive messages. Um, some people thought that the messages should be sent for a longer duration of time. Uh, one person said that it should actually be shorter. Um, there were a couple people who thought the messages should be more interactive. So instead of just one-way messaging, they wanted to be able to respond back to the messages they received. And actually, there were quite a few people who sent responses. I could read them, but I never replied to them because this is a one-way text messaging um, program. A few people thought that messaging Message tailoring was important, um, meaning that the, the messages were sent to specific people based on their specific needs. And then video revision, um, some people just didn't like the video. And again, that's a personal preference. Not everybody is going to want to watch videos on their phone. So based on these suggestions, there were several changes that I think should be implemented in phase three of this study. They are, number one, to send the videos directly to the mobile phone. So using a different platform where I don't have to use a link and have them go out to a separate website. Um, also allowing participants to choose the time of day that they receive the messages. And then um, using a platform with more precise data. So um, again, I couldn't tell who clicked on the link or who clicked on the play button. It would be nice to tell which participant was engaging in the intervention. And then lastly, tailoring to participants' needs based on their self-reported sexual partner activity. So there were several um, messages that included, for instance, information on anal sex. But if you're not having anal sex, then you might not want that type of information. Or there was information on um, having sex with casual partners. Well, if you don't have a casual partner, if you only have a main partner, the casual partner text messages are kind of irrelevant to you. So tailoring messages more for their specific needs would be nice. So lastly, I'm just going to talk about, oh sorry, I do you want to say anything about the feasibility data at all and question I think what's that one um, question? Can you go back to the one uh, with the control group and the feasibility data? Um, can you talk a little bit about the control group, some of the tricks and things? So, um, <laughs> the control group had lower scores on, well kind of similar to the, um, 
actually move on. I wish there were more text messages. So this is three is a neutral number. Um, it's slightly below that neutral line where it's actually reversed though because it's kind of negatively connotated. So this lower number, um, no, because I reversed it, the lower number is bad. So they were saying that they wish, sorry, that's my timer. They wish there were um, slightly more messages. So for people who would like more messages, I mean, it's almost like both are kind of sad to some extent. Yeah. So I want to know what you would make of that and kind of how you would do it, like um, in terms of some people don't, some people do, but you got both. It's kind of saying more would be okay. So, but then you go up here, I found it difficult to receive the text message. So I'm trying to reconcile how to, like in the next iteration, how to fix it. The, um, Second version, so the first version of this text messaging program was actually 36 messages, not 12. So we actually have a version of the text messaging program that's three text messages per week over 12 weeks instead of eight. We ended up cutting it down to eight, um, really, I think for me mostly, so it wouldn't be a very long um, text message study, but the the research advisory board and the focus group actually asked for a 12-week study. When I went back to my topical experts and to my research at um, my community advisory board, we decided to cut it down to eight weeks. I'm wondering if you're thinking about with, with tailoring to some degree, giving people a link if they wanted more information, for example, about the topic. Mm -hmm. that's right. See, that's and a, that's and well, that was going to be my next part, because in the next one, what she was talking about was tailoring the messages. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of wondering if you tailor both the messages mm -hmm. as well as kind of, you would have a way in which you could pick a program <coughs> to some extent, mm -hmm. and it would be, these are my risk factors, and so this is what you pick to push out to them. Mm -hmm. And then you could start off with, more messages, and throughout, they could come back and say, too many. And so you could kind of get it down to, because um, people really like when they have apps, these health apps, is to, to vent, rather than us, to them to help to modify what works for them, mm -hmm. especially in like the, the health fitness side. So I was trying to figure out if you could do the same thing here. And I actually think you potentially could do that, which really would very successful. It's totally doable. So one of the things that I wanted to do was select a platform. Maybe it would be more work on my end, but that's okay. Select a platform that would allow people to select, for instance, uh, the people who wanted messages more frequently. Maybe they want a message every day, where some people only want it three times a week. And you could choose based on your um, the time you have, or based on how often you want to look at your phone. Well, it would be a stuff. metric of change, what you want, right. not to just let them totally. Again, in fitness, the way this thing goes is you have a goal that you try and reach, and so then you modify your app based on that. So if there was a goal they were trying to reach, how successful they were at setting that goal. And the goal doesn't have to be a behavior. The goal could be a thought. The goal could be an intention. Mm -hmm. So that's when you go back to the model. So in other fitness apps, that's what you do. It may be your intention, because you're not ready yet to climb Mount Everest. But you know, your intention is better and you purchase a ticket or, I mean, so there, there are ways in which we set the goals like that. So I think you should think about um, that as a potential adaptation. That would be very marketable. Can I just clarify, you mean that she would, she would interact with the person, the person would, in a way, choose how much they, they're, they're, it's, in a way it's an interaction. Right? Because the person has a more right. say it's, so. It's, no, it's an assessment at the beginning, and what okay. happens is, depending on what, how many risk factors you have, then you would say, these are the messages that probably should be pushed out to you. Right. And the person might say, well, I don't want to change this kind of sexual activity, or I'm not ready to get off of, of using drugs or anything. And you could say, okay, but, you know. But let's talk about sex. Exactly. Yeah. So then you begin to change things, and then as you change things, you can either add more things, or what you can do is if it's too overwhelming, you stay focused at, okay, you're going to focus on this risk factor and not the rest. 
And then you, over time, once the person really put to the program and you give them real positive feedback about change, then they'll add other things on. But the person would be interacting with Tiffany or the person who's married. No, it's like you can make this really based on an algorithm. They have these on computers more often. Very often. Yeah. 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 So it's on like algorithms, and if you do X and Y, and then it gives you oh. the feedback. I mean, that's what we try to design ours so that there's very little people power involved because otherwise it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that might be something to do with. Um, in the next phase, they need the baseline survey, asking certain questions, mm -hmm. and yes. then it's figuring like doing out. This, it's right. like doing the assessment mm -hmm. and setting it up. Based on what we see here, you have these blah, 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 blah. And here's what we recommend. And But you can always scale back and focus only on one or all. And it's kind of like that. Here's the question. What do you make of the almost uh, disparate when you see when they say, I enjoyed receiving the text messages, that's pretty high. Uh, but yet, uh, the text messages were too frequent. Did you say that you reversed it? So in other words, they, they did not think it was too frequent. The majority did not think it was too frequent. Is that the way you're interpreting that? Yeah, well, on the, I wish I would, It's uh, the third one. Oh, yes, that's reversed. So so the majority did not think it was too frequent. Correct. Right. Okay. They were happy. Okay. And I wish there were more text messages. That was reversed as well. But it almost still hits that yeah, neutral line. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So um, but wishing there were more, but yet they enjoyed it. So they didn't. So basically, they, they liked it. They wanted basically more. Basically, they liked it. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was. And they didn't find it difficult. No, no. That was reversed as well. Right. They, I think they were pretty <laughs> So as far as primary outcomes, uh, I had three different hypotheses. The first was that the women in the intervention group would have a significantly higher um, common use rate from baseline to post-intervention compared to those in the control group. And I asked questions about vaginal sex, oral sex, and anal sex, but I'm only going to present the information on the vaginal sex. Um, so this is the descriptive data, and I use the generalized estimating equation um, to determine the outcomes of this data. So you can see that at baseline, for instance, 88% of the intervention group and 87% of the control group were having vaginal sex. This number actually decreased over time in both groups. So whereas some people started out, actually everybody has to have some type of sex to even be enrolled in the um, study where people started out sexually active, several people actually went abstinent during the um, intervention. There was also um, an increase in the number of people who used the condom every time they had sex from baseline to follow up, and again, this is in both groups. Um, there was a decrease in the number of people who sometimes use condoms, and what I found was that because the number of people who never used condoms didn't really change, I'm looking at the percentages, not the actual numbers, um, the people from the sometimes group either went to the always group or they stopped having sex with the main partner during the duration of this study. Um, so there was an increase in vaginal sex with, I'm sorry, the incidence of vaginal sex with main partner decreased among both groups, and because it decreased among both groups, um, and there was no uh, time interaction, the hypothesis was actually rejected. Um, for the study's purposes, not such a great thing, but for a public health standpoint, wonderful. People started having sex with condoms more or stopped having sex altogether, which is a great thing. Hypothesis number two looked at um, the rates uh, or the scores of self-efficacy, intention, and the power scale, and said that the young women in the intervention group would have higher rates of each of these constructs than the women in the control group. And so what was found was that, um, and this is a re the result of a repeated measures ANOVA, there were significant time effects in the common use mechanics subscale as well as, well as the intention subscale. So over time, both groups increased. This is the baseline, all these at the top, and the follow-up scores. Both groups increased over time in both intentions 
and in mechanics. These increases weren't significant, but it was only eight weeks. So there was an increase, which is great. But again, because the increase was among both groups, the hypothesis was rejected. And lastly, hypothesis number three um, was looking at predictors of common use. So I wanted to see what constructs or what sociodemographic um, characteristics predicted a person's common use. And what I found was that um, at baseline, intention was a predictor for those who always use condoms and those who sometimes use condoms. So the way you read this table is to say that for every one point increase in intention, among um, every one point increase in intention, there was almost twice the likelihood for every or the odds of a participant always using condoms during that sex with main partner are almost twice as likely for those who always use condoms compared to those who never use condoms. So for every one point increase in, in, in the intention score, you're almost twice as likely to always use a condom as you are to never use a condom, at least for these particular participants. The same is true um, for sometimes using condoms. So for every one point increase in intentions, you were 1.3 times as likely to sometimes use a condom as you were to never use a condom. However, at follow-up, the uh, intention still came out as a predictor for those who always use condoms. At follow-up, for every one-point increase in intention score, you were 1.6 times as likely to always use a condom as to never use a condom. But it didn't come through for those who sometimes use condoms. For those who sometimes use condoms, assertiveness was a predictor of sometimes condom use. And what came out is that for every one point increase in assertiveness, you were actually half as likely to sometimes use a condom as you were to never use a condom. And it seems counterintuitive at first, but if you really think about it, if you have a partner who is agreeing with you either to always use condom or more so to never use condom, it's not a conversation that you guys really have. You both agree to never use condoms or always use condoms. If you have a partner, however, who only sometimes wants to use condoms, or you're only sometimes able to persuade him to use a condom, your assertiveness has to be higher than the person who's never using condoms because their partner agrees to never use condoms, or who's always using condoms because their partner agrees to always use condoms. You have to have higher levels of assertiveness in those moments where you're actually able to persuade the person to use a condom. So, like I said, looking at it at first, it, it kind of seems counterintuitive, but it actually makes a lot of sense. So in conclusion, um, there were several implications for practice and research um, based on my findings. The first was that texting is actually an acceptable and also a feasible form of health education. And again, this was whether we were looking at sexual health or we were looking at diet and exercise for the African American women or black women ages 18 to 24, they enjoy receiving text messages. Um, we need to continue to implement high-risk sexual behavior interventions that increase common use intentions because intentions were what were predictive of common use behavior at baseline and then for those who always use condoms at follow-up. We need to continue using the theory of planned behavior to gu guide the design and evaluation of high-risk sexual behavior studies this is where that construct of intention comes from. So continuing to use this theory is actually a really smart thing to do. And then examine ways to strengthen the outcomes of the study. Again, this study was primarily an acceptability and feasibility study. But looking forward toward phase three, there are certain things that I could definitely do to potentially increase um, the outcome. And I'm looking to make those changes because so I actually want to continue with this study. There were several um, strengths and limitations to the study. Some of the strengths included the high acceptability rate among study participants, the use of community-based participatory research. So this study was not mine alone. If you heard me, I said we every time I talked about something that was done in this study because the intervention was created by my research advisory board, was um, kind of vetted by my focus groups, and um, topical experts, and then the community advisory board from CHIPS. Also, the use of mixed methods was really helpful. I have a lot of qualitative data 
that I can draw on a lot. And um, it was very helpful in designing the intervention to not just give people scales and to see how they like things on a micro scale, but to actually ask them their opinions and let them write their own comments. And then lastly, the retention rate was out of this world. It was extremely high. So I'm looking forward to having that retention rate as high or maybe even higher in the next study. Some of the limitations of the study included a highly educated population. So um, for phase two, the vast majority of my participants were in college. And that's not necessarily reflective of the black population in the U.S. So um, getting a more generalizable population for phase three is something that I'm looking forward to. Also, um, there was no knowledge of delayed impact. So for this particular study, I looked at their baseline surveys, and their follow-up surveys were sent immediately after they received the last text message. Not immediately, but they received the last text message on a Friday. The follow-up surveys were sent the following Monday. So there was really no time for delayed impact. Where when you're looking at efficacy studies, um, and if you think back to <coughs> that compendium and the, um, the best evidence criteria, you need to look at the follow-up uh, outcomes at least three months out, which I didn't do because I was just looking at acceptability and feasibility. Um, there was a different baseline and follow-up recall period. So at baseline, I asked them about their sexual behaviors three months prior, but at follow-up, I only asked them about eight weeks. So keeping the same um, recall period would be nice in the next phase. And then lastly, there was a potential for contamination. So I didn't really talk about this before, but 40% of my study population was recruited via what we call snowballing which means they knew somebody who was in the study that told them about it, and then they enrolled. So having so many people in the study who knew each other increased the potential that the study participants were talking to each other and that the groups were somehow contaminated. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple of things that I'm going to do next time to try to prevent that. Um, so thank you, and now questions. Can you, um, because the two groups uh, improved sort of similarly with uh, the, uh, your sexual outcome measures, uh, but yet the control group didn't get anything about uh, reducing their <coughs> sex, what do you attribute the uh, improvement in the control group to? So there are a couple of things. Um, I think that one is um, they were sensitized to the thought of their sexual behaviors because they were in the study. So at baseline, I gave out these surveys asking them about all these sexual behaviors they had, and that could acute them into the fact that, hey, maybe I'm not doing what I really should be doing or what I thought I was doing. Let me um, have better sexual help you know, for myself. So at the follow-up, which was only eight weeks later, there's a really strong possibility that they were still very much in tune to their own sexual health behaviors and had improved those um, just by mere fact that they were involved in the study. The other thing is response bias. So there's also um, a possibility that people responded to the survey in the way in which they thought I, as a researcher, would want them to respond. So uh, by being sent all these sexual health questions, and I actually sent them guided exercise questions too, just to kind of throw them off a little bit, but they might have realized um, you know, she's asking me something about my sexual health. She probably wants to hear me say, mm -hmm. I'm using condoms. And so they... So how would you change that for the future? In the future, I think that that will actually correct itself um, with the delayed um, impact onset. So if I'm asking them questions at baseline, but then I have several follow-up periods, and periods that are at least three months out from the end of the intervention, I think it'll self-correct. Um, <laughs> Maybe a little bit. Maybe a little. I also think to add to that, if her 40%, they're sharing, they talk about sharing and waiting for friends to see those text messages, that would that would mean that people in the control group were seeing maybe, and that definitely, if they were getting the same message, could have contributed to one of the things that um, I was saying when I said there was a discrepancy between self-report and what I could see on the platform data about the video watching, um, I received several emails from people who said, hey, my friends have received their follow-up survey. Why haven't I? And I thought, well, how do you know your friends received their follow-up survey already? So clearly, people were talking to each other about the study. 
And if 15 people said that they watched all seven videos, but I can clearly see that 15, that all seven videos were watched 15 times, there is a potential that it could have all been watching them together. Only one person hit the play button, but you got three people standing around the phone watching. So they could have been telling the truth about watching all seven videos. Uh, but that's not what I saw because only one person hit play. So there are, you know, and the control person also watching at the same time. Huh? Absolutely, <laughs> that's a huge uh, potential. Let's talk a little bit about um, the sample um, and how it may account for some of this because you have a, a highly educated sample, um, and if I remember correctly, a lot of these were individuals who were in college. Yes. Right? Sexual behavior is very different. Going to school reduces the likelihood of pregnancy and reduces the likelihood of STDs and stuff like that. So you really got a population for whom um, they're focused on other things. So you may want to do a couple of things. One is to get a sense of likelihood of engaging in sex over time. Because it's not unusual that black women, particularly if they're on college campus and they're not other black men, that's who they're going to date that are around in that greater numbers, but they are abstinent for longer periods of time. Mm -hmm. So it may be that that's part of what you're getting is the school going and you know they want to change their behavior so they got in the study. But really there's very little risk to them because there wasn't the opportunity. Right. So I think finding out about state of readiness to change is important. But I think also finding out about some measure of avail availability of partners and dating mm -hmm. and things like that could also be helpful because what you may be seeing is that they're just not doing anything because they're just a good person and they're not really being tempted to have to try this stuff out. Um, I think that if you think also about your control group and the, um, the group you're trying to change, the notion of Readiness, risk factor, and availability would actually be a very good predictor. You know? mm -hmm. And you could then see how they take to the um, intervention. Yeah, I think some of them, they were enjoying having this conversation and stuff like that since they kind of got snowballed and through it, and it was enjoyable and all that. And that part of what it was is it became not a social desirability issue with you, but with the friends sense of they watch the stuff together, they're talking about it, and they may know who's there to date, particularly if they're going to date within their group. And so there's kind of like, you know, you keep the sister pack at that point more so mm -hmm. than, you know, violating it and going out and dating. So I think you really in the next one have to not have contamination. Oh, yes. So um, I wrote a little bit in Chapter 7, and I'm thinking about something like designing the study so that um, young women from particular areas or regions of the country are among who get the post to another. It's not the best study design, but it would help to decrease the level of contamination. Um, and even asking, do you know anyone else in this study, perhaps? Mm -hmm. well, not do snowball. Not yeah. do snowball. Yeah. Yeah. No, if you make it all virtual, then you don't have to worry right. in the sense of you have greater control over mm -hmm. who you recruit in. And you then just get a few sensitive pieces They won't know that anyone else, if, if you don't use snowball, they won't know. Yeah. Right. It'll just be private. Mm -hmm. Unless they're talking, I mean, I I started out for phase two, actually for phase one, I started out recruiting a hair salon, which was a total bust. Mm -hmm. um, and I, there are several reasons why I think that yeah. happened. Right. But I moved to online recruiting. Um, and there were actually quite a few people who responded to the Facebook ad. But then when I sent them information, they didn't contact me yet. But there were people who, I know for a fact, they found out through Facebook, but they said, you know, oh, my friend told me about this Facebook ad. Or my, so it's still a potential, um, but I think it would decrease if I'm not recruiting from college campuses and certain college organizations. But also then if you just ask, um, you know, has anyone recommended you, how 
how did you hear about it? Mm -hmm. You know, they, they won't understand why those questions aren't as asked, but they'll boot it out. So I think you can do that. Oh, so you would exclude them if they had yes. heard about it from a friend. Yes. Yeah. That's yes. the exclusion. I would. I would. I'd almost say that if you really want the intervention to have greater generalizability, you make the population much more like the high risk. And even though college going women are at risk, that's not really the highest risk. I would take the education level down. Mm -hmm. And then what it means is that you have to deal with what kinds of people you're, you have to change your platform because like in one of our studies we use dumb numbers. So I mean we wanted to make sure it was diabetes study in the older women. Sometimes it's in a phone so the thing is call. So we don't design it so it's a smartphone. We design it as a texting. Yeah. And that's all you're gonna do on so that it reaches, you know, kind of what we call dumb phone. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Yeah. 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 No, no, no. Yeah. 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 But, but, can I, but just to continue with that conversation, if she tried to get the population that weren't college age going, but wasn't able to, what would you change so you could, you think just online would work, but you said they didn't respond. So what would be the next steps? Well, people did respond online. I think Facebook was actually a really good way to do recruitment, especially for this age group. Um, I got the largest number of people from email responses and snowballing. I didn't ask in the snowballing where did the other person get the information from. So for all I know, snowballing, they could have all come from people who found out through Facebook as well. Um, but I think that I think that just by mere fact that this is a study and people in college are, at least at four-year universities, are somewhat um, comfortable with uh, studies. I think they're a little, they might be a little bit more inclined to participate in something like this than somebody who's not in college, doesn't know anything about research, thinks I'm going to give them TV or something, um, you know, based on what they hear. In the so story. again, how are you going to get that? The population you want, how are you going to get them? I actually like online recruitment a lot. I think that it was very effective. And I recruited an extremely high number of people in a really short amount of time. But not the population you want. But that's because I did a lot of recruitment at college campuses. Mm -hmm. If I just look specifically at the Facebook group, mm -hmm. I think those people were far more generalizable mm -hmm. than the people who came from these four-year institutions. Mm -hmm. Could you separate that group with that? I can't because I didn't ask follow-up questions. Um, I wanted to, to follow up on something that, that Dr. May said, because I think it, it fills as a recommendation or possibility for um, future research with the, with the designing. Because if you're finding the power of attention, one of the things you could do mid-intervention is do an assessment of attention and direct them. And so using some of what you were calling output measures as assessment measures in, in, in the built into the intervention, which then relate to stage of change in some of the theory and, and keeping going. So someone who's already intending would get continue on that focus. Right. And the mm -hmm. others, they're not even contemplating. It fits very well with the contemplation. Mm -hmm. So I, I think like that. That would add to the literature of whether intention really does affect outcomes in the long run. Mm -hmm. One of the a, a beautiful studies and, and one of the great strengths of the study, which you know, we've all mentioned, is, is that the women, like, they wanted to do it, they engaged in it, and you put considerable effort into designing this. And, and it shows that you, you have used the, your, your RAV, and you've had your focus groups, and all of that information is valuable, and is something that you're going to want to publish and want to get out there. What, what I want to suggest to you is that the, the very rich quotes that you have in Chapter 7 in your discussion actually are, the, they themselves are results because they're, they're pithy uh, data. And so I want to suggest that you move those results to your data chapters, your results chapters, and uh, keep, keep your discussion discussing about what the results were. Um, the, the ones that are from the RAV and you know the, 
people with the pseudonyms, Charlotte, Delilah, whatnot. Um, those are the ones I'm talking about. You also have some wonderful quotes from your RAs that you have in your discussion. And those seem to be very linked to discussing the methodology. And I think those maybe you could keep in the discussion. But I would, I would remove the quotes. I would suggest that you paraphrase them. And in, uh, I also think you probably have a little bit more to say about them. And in terms of how, uh, what this, why this matters. I, I, I can't emphasize enough that I think your methodology is really the gem here. What you did and how you transformed something that was a face-to-face, -face, um, older, and you updated it and you brought, you breathed new life into it. You brought a whole bunch of different uh, aspects uh, in digitally to it. That's really the sparkling gem there. And so we want to make sure that that continues to sparkle. You don't know this, but the publisher of the, the, of the manual right now, that's just what they're doing with all of these interventions. So she's right on with that comment that it's really necessary. Do it the slide where you have actually the, um, what it is you did in terms of direction and so on. You should change that and put in every time you change, because you didn't quite say every time you did. Because what the public needs to see is what it is you need to do when you're working with this population. That's a regular time. So, and it's like, I'm making another color or something to say, you can't just go this way. This is what you know, these other studies have said. But in this population, here's where we have to go back. Yeah. And the going back actually is very supportive of you know, community-based participatory methods. So you're going back to have the original voice, and you're changing again, and you're going back. So I, I think, again, it's like, well, what is the newness? The newness is better understanding what cultural tailoring is. Yes. It's almost like, you know, the, the discussion really has a lot to do with not just, well, you know, we did this, but how did you update the demands, you know, intervention? Well, this is what a black woman said in, you know, 2016 or 15 that they wanted. You know, how do you update the, and I think that was, um, was that um, Gina and, yes. and Ralph's stuff? Okay. How do you do it now in terms of black women and within this? What, part of what we try to do is to say, what's the fidelity issue? So what's the fidelity of going from a face-to-face, person-type intervention to a, you know, a now online technology-driven intervention? And I think what you need to do is to be able to show where the people need to stay in. Because some people will build these things, and the people's voices weren't here. And then the next part is why it is you can have totally, you know, total technology and being know, totally comfortable with it because you had the voices and you've proven the fidelity from the original to the transition to technology. That's where I think the, the contributions come from. Thank you. Anyone? Thank you. making it easy for the reader to see and to understand all that went into it and not letting it, not having it just go assumed. Make it, make it clear and and, um, and let it be showcased so that people can repeat it. As if you said only five out of 93 interventions had actually asked black women themselves how they thought about it and how they would do it and would have any participatory aspect or address the issues of pride in terms of themselves in the community. That's big news. We want to make sure that you really showcase that. So some, some of this will be able to, just updating the chat, chat and making some revisions and stuff, and then others will be your article. That's why I'm writing all yeah. these notes it's of how you would integrate these recommendations because they've been excellent in terms of you'll be able to contribute to other scientists who want to do a similar thing if we, we really make this clear. 
We're not suggesting all these things have to now be put into just a point, but if you have the data to look at, you can make, you certainly can reframe some of this. Yeah. Steers and much. Yeah. So just I want to do one more suggestion um, based on um, what you just said. I can even see that, that, um, that, that, you know, kind of yellow line. The yellow, yeah, yeah. the yellow yeah. figure, when you did put in the other things, what you should do is take the qualitative data and say, it, I can see, you can do an arrow of who said what in terms of the things, mm -hmm. and then what part did it affect. Mm -hmm. Because see, that's that what, yeah, yeah, that's what would be powerful in, in, a, in a paper, is to mm -hmm. understand how they affect what parts so of people are very clear that you shouldn't just rush ahead. Mm -hmm. And that helps people in terms of the, how they use that's where you get the integration. What do I do with technology with the actual intervention? Because those are really the big questions. So I think if you could do that, I mean, I can almost see how it Yeah, the diagram is great. The diagram, and then you do the things, and then you do who in the community represented it. And it really brings the critical yes. theory to life. Yes. Because you're very committed to critical theory. Yes. And so, so this would be a way to express that. And so often when people take the time, to do an emancipation-oriented, critical theory-informed study, they don't showcase it enough. And so students and other researchers don't have a model to know how to, how would I do it? They think, oh, it's philosophy. No, this is real. This is on-the-ground reality. And this is how I did it. So there's a blueprint you can look at, and you can also you can all tell by the extent of our mm -hmm. excitement that this is a really interesting and, and, and excellent dissertation. We're all kind of thinking about the science and moving ahead. I, if it's okay, I would like one question from our audience, well, most pressing, and then we're going to leave the room a little bit. Are you all going to be here long enough to tell us more than one question? I'm sure. Okay. I actually have two, um, two questions for you. Great. Can you speak a little louder? Sure. Um, I have two questions for you, Tiffany. One goes into creating a catalog that could be more specific or tailored to the individual participant who's interested in, let's say, I don't need anything about condom use, but I would like something more about self-efficacy, or I would like to know something about um, behaviors that may be surrounded by and which you do not discuss in your presentation, which is anal sex because we know in this, this population that is also taking place. So I wanted to know if you had any thoughts about how you would create an interactive catalog that would allow the participant to select what's more prevalent to them, or pertinent to them. And then my second question is also to touch on the rich qualitative data that you have in this project. And I was wondering, is, as you've gone through your dissertation, have you noticed any themes emerging from looking at some